Hello, welcome back to the new lecture. Uh, we'll be discussing some breast surgery, and uh, this is a very high yield lecture, so we're gonna try. This is gonna be very comprehensive. And I apologize ahead of time for a very lengthy lecture, but it's a very high yield lecture. It's gonna show up on your shelves and step two, uh, over and over again. All right, so let's start with the case. We have a 48 year old female comes to clinics recently noticed right breast mass. She's a mother of one child. No significant family history of breast cancer. And on exam, you do not feel any axillary lymph nodes. This is a typical case you're going to get. Uh, sometimes it can get pretty lengthy. But some of the things that you want to look out for is age and um, uh, her history of uh, cancers in her family and in herself and uh, possibility of uh, some palpable lymph nodes. That's going to guide you to some more worrisome sign. So what do you start thinking about when you see a breast lump? Like when do you start differentiating cancers versus something not cancers? First of all, look at the age. If you see anybody who's older than 50, in your mind you should think uh, breast mass and anybody that's older than 50 should be cancer unless proven otherwise. So always think cancer and the ways you can rule it out. Family history. If there's family history of uh, breast cancer, in, in, in this question stem, then you should start getting worried. But now, don't get confused here. Now, if they say, my grandma had a cancer when she was 82, that's a lot different than my mom and my aunt and four or five people in my family had breast cancer. Because, remember, you hear this a lot. One in eight people get breast cancer. One in eight women get breast cancer. Now, that is after age 50, especially the elderly ones. Then that's what the one in eight comes from. The majority of them are in that age group so watch out for that if they have unilateral spontaneous discharge then you got to think that it's something worrisome if there's a description of mass sometimes the question stem gives you that so if it sounds scary it's firm it's non-mobile it's adhered to the tissue it just it does not sound good it's most likely you, you're dealing with cancer interesting fact if they say that it's painful it's less likely to be malignant now, obviously, if there's any lymph nodes that are painless lymph nodes, especially in the area of the drainage of the breast, then you got to think of possibly cancer versus, you know, uh, benign disease. Now, nipple discharge. You know, you get this a lot in the question stem, and uh, it could guide you towards a cancer, uh, cancer versus benign, right? So if it's spontaneous unilateral discharge in somebody who's older than 40, you want to think of cancer. Now, spontaneous, that means nothing happened. There was no trauma. There was no infection. This just happened by itself. And unilateral, watch out for that. If it's green discharge, you want to think of fibrocystic disease, and we'll cover it later in the lecture. Bloody discharge, actually most common cause of that is introductory papilloma and it's a little bit less worrisome and what do you do for introductory papilloma you do a ductogram which you literally inject the dye and uh, you see where the duct is bleeding from and then you excise that area serious discharge is actually cancer so what does it mean by serious it's just kind of murky in color it's not a you know it's like a tissue color I have a, how to describe it and if you get that as a serious discharge you want to get a biopsy like an excisional versus an FNA and we're going to cover that in, in later in lecture but I want you to see these different types of uh, this nipple discharges that describe and what, what might guide you towards an answer so what can it be if you have somebody that's younger than 40, it could be fibrocystic change, fibroadenoma, fat necrosis, intraductal papilloma, abscess, Mandor's disease that we'll cover in a little bit, and possibly cancer. So young people, even on question stems and in real life, fair number of them get breast cancer, right? But obviously benign disease is a little bit more or higher in your differential. Now, if they're older than 40, still fibroadenoma is the most common cause of breast mass, but you gotta worry about ductal carcinoma in situ ductal cancer, inflammatory carcinoma, or phyllodes tumor. So this is what they, they're they going to get at you. So general considerations. What what should you think of any type of uh, breast mass that comes in in your question stem or even in clinic? I want you to get this idea of a triple test. What's a triple test? Triple test is three tests, right? Physical exam, some kind of imaging, mammogram versus ultrasound, and that's going to de determine on age, and we'll cover this a little bit, and some kind of tissue sampling, right? Either FNA, core needle biopsy, right? Or an excisional biopsy. So I want you to remember that no matter what the imaging shows, you're going to get 
some kind of a biopsy. Actually, about 10% of malignant cancers have negative imaging, right? So if they say mammogram or ultrasound does not show anything, you still want to do some kind of a biopsy. Now, what's the difference between a corneal biopsy and excisional biopsy? Corneal biopsy is you go with a needle into the core of the mass, right? And you take a sample out of the core of the mass. Versus excisional biopsy is you excise some kind of tissue over the lesion and you take out the whole lesion, you take it out, all of it out, you excise it, right? Excisional biopsy is better than corneal biopsy. Now, you're always going to have questions where it's going to say, do you do an FNA versus a, some kind of a biopsy? So when would you use an FNA? Think of FNA as a cytology test. It's like uh, if you're sucking something like out of a fruit, it's going to tell you what's inside the fruit, but nothing else, right? You just you can't tell you if there's a tissue invasion. If it can tell you there's there's you're uh, invading the capsule, it, it's really very limited, right? If you do an FNA, if a question describes that you do an FNA, then it shows a def definite malignancy. Right, there's multiple mitoses that describe it's just it looks very malignant. Then you want to do a treat. They already tell you it's cancer, so you want to treat it, right? If FNA is suspicious, it doesn't give you it's not very diagnostic because you don't know if it's invading or not, right? Then that's where you do a corneal biopsy or excisional biopsy. So remember this, right? Excisional biopsy is better than corneal biopsy, and a corneal biopsy is better than FNA. Why is this important to know? Because it's the question already give you an imaging or if they give you some kind of a physical exam what's the next best step and FNA and corneal biopsy is there obviously pick corneal biopsy then rather than FNA FNA is an inferior test uh, in terms of tissue so remember that triple test you always have to do a physical exam you always have to have some kind of imaging and the important part is a tissue you got to get a tissue because tissue is an issue right and then that's where you got to differentiate between FNA and a corneal biopsy now, if somebody comes out older than a 40, right, then you're a little bit more worrisome about a cancer, right? You do a physical exam, but they describe that to you in a question stem, right? You take an exam, they'll tell you what's going on. You get a mammogram and, and an ultrasound. Mammogram is going to tell you if the tissue is invading or not, and it could also tell you if the other breast is affected or not. An ultrasound helps you with localization. That's, you know, you could use an ultrasound to get more uh, accurate tissue sampling, right? Now, important point again. Um, you know, I repeated it uh, multiple times. Regardless of what the mammogram or ultrasound sh shows, you always get a tissue sample. And if they're older than 40, you should get a mammogram and an ultrasound. But if mammogram says negative, don't get confused. You get a tissue sample. All right? This is where they trick you is, oh, a female comes into your clinic. She's 47. And six months ago, she had a negative mammogram. And you, you feel a breast mass. It's not going away. What do you do? Don't do nothing. You want to get a tissue sampling, right? The negative mammogram six months ago does not tell you anything. That's why some of the organizations tell you yearly mammogram because mammograms can change over a year period of time. If they're younger than 40, then it's a little bit, you know, tricky. Now, obviously, physical exam from the question stem. You want to do ultrasound rather than a mammogram. Remember, mammogram is a lot of radiation, right? This is a common, you know, um, theme. If you see a young patient in a question stand, aim towards less radiation. Okay, so you know, that's what they want to get you at. Because, I mean, obviously radiation increases the risk of cancer in the future. and So that's why you want to aim on the side of low radiation. Now, if they describe a cyst, it's not bothering anyone, it's not getting bigger, and it's not painful, you leave it alone for you know, a couple of weeks or a month. If it goes away, then you're done. But if it doesn't go in a way and you want to biopsy it, right, what's a cyst? It's, uh, you know, it's filled with fluid. What's the best way to, you know, get a sample of that? You get an FNA. So you get an FNA, you biopsy the, uh, that's the biopsy of it. Now, if it's bloody, you send it to cytology and it shows cancers, then you want to get a definitive answer about the tissue. So you do an excisional biopsy in that regard. If it's clear, it goes away, but it comes back, then you want the excisional biopsy. If it goes away and doesn't come back, then you're done. Right? So if it's bloody and goes away, it doesn't matter. You want to get some kind of excisional biopsy, some kind of biopsy that definitely tells you that mass is not cancer. If it's clear and goes away, then you're done. If it comes back, then you got to do biopsy. Remember, FNA is not the best. If it's a solid mass, right, you can't really do... Um, uh, you can't really do an FNA on it. It's a solid, right? So you could, but it's not going to give you as much better an answer. So you want to do either corneal biopsy or excisional biopsy. And if you're stuck between the two choices, you know the excisional biopsy is better than corneal biopsy.
Now, here's the algorithm you follow. So, breast mass, younger than 30 years old, utero ultrasound. Shows a simple cyst, right? You need a f uh, FNA. If it's not, then you could do FNA corneal biopsy. And uh, uh, But remember, uh, you know, excisional uh, and the corneal biopsy are going to give you a better answer. If it's a cystic lesion, it's clear or green. Um, you, you, you take it out. If it comes back, um, you do some kind of biopsy again. If it doesn't come back, then you don't worry about it. And then if it's a solid lesion, then you got to look at what it shows, right? If it shows a uh, possible, you know, suspicious finding, then you want to do a def definitive test. If it's definitely malignant, then you want to do some kind of a therapy. But if it's benign and um, you don't have imaging, then you want to do some kind of a biopsy again. So remember, FNA is not give you, going to give you 100%. So th that's why other biopsies are better answer choices. So let's talk about general surgical principles that our um, patients with breast cancer are going to uh, encounter. So lymph node biopsy, that's going to be asked a lot. So sentinel lymph node biopsy, SLNB, right? What is that? So what happens is you find a tumor, you inject a radioactive substance or a dye into the tumor, and then you use a probe to see which lymph nodes are affected, and you take it out. Right, and there's three different levels, and I don't think they're gonna ask you on the exam. Uh, and you, if um, if it shows up, you literally like if it says level one and two, um, is the probe picks up the dye or the radioactive substance in there, then you take one and two. Then you don't have to take all three because you don't really want to take all the lymph drainage from the tissue. So, so remember. If they're palpable axillary lymph nodes, if they say there's palpable, you felt it on the exam, you don't want to do a, uh, uh, a sentinel lymph node biopsy, right? You have to do axillary lymph node dissection. You have to take it, you remove the whole thing, right? And some of the ways they trick you up on the exams is there's, n you know, you do a uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy and the probe does not pick up at all. There's nothing that, you, you know, pops out. So what you have to do is you have to do an axillary lymph node dissection. If it doesn't pick up anything, you have to do axillary lymph node dissection. If you feel axillary lymph nodes, you don't do a uh, sentinel lymph node. You take them out. So this ALNDs, axillary lymph node dissection, what are the risks with it, right? So you take out the whole lymphatic drainage from the arm. Remember, the axilla drains also the breast, but also drains the arm, right? So what happens? You get lymphedema. So the ipsilateral arm, you know, can get huge because, you know, there's not a lot of drainage. It, it's very painful. And then this is, uh, that tends to show up in the exam, not, uh, maybe not as much on step two, but definitely you've seen a step one and it can show up on, the, on your shelves, is if you have a long-standing lymphedema, you could, uh, you could develop lymphangiosarcoma, and that's a very, uh, you know, bad prognostic disease. Then they'll ask you, and they'll go back to your basic anatomy. What are the most common nerves injured in axial lymph node dissection? Your long thoracic nerve, remember it innervates the serratus interior, and the common, you know, typical case you get is if you damage it, you get a winged scapula. So I would remember that as well. So what are your surgical options? So somebody comes in, you know, it's you have to take it out. So what, what things can you do? You could do breast conserving therapy. So what's the breast conserving therapy? You do a lumpectomy, so you remove the tumor with a little bit of the breast tissue around, right? So you, you leave the breast intact. You do a lymph node dissection, sentinel lymph node dissection. You take out the lymph nodes that are affected, and you have to do a radiation therapy. Versus a simple mastectomy, you take out the whole breast, you do a sentinel lymph node biopsy, but you don't give radiation because you took out the breast. Now, so here it is. It's a tumor area to be removed. So lumpectomy, you take out the lump. Partial mastectomy, you take out a little bit of the tissue, uh, breast tissue. Total mastectomy, you take out the tumor in the, um, and, the, uh, and the breast. And a modified radical mastectomy, you take out the breast, the lymph nodes, and some of the lymph glands as well. So um, some of the things to remember between a breast conserving therapy and a simple mastectomy. So compared to simple mastectomy, it's only better in terms of cosmetics, right? It's the same survival, but there's a higher local recurrence, right? So they will describe, so think about a case, they're like, oh, this lady had a simple mastectomy two years ago, had a, had a breast, con uh, breast cons uh, had a breast conserving therapy, right? And now you feel like a little bit of uh, palpable mass around the area where she had the surgery. That's higher recurrence, right? And then you have to do a mastectomy afterwards. You don't do a breast conserving th therapy in pregnant females. You can't give fetus irradiation, right? So what do you do? You do a surgery. You take out the, 
if you want to do breast conserving, you take you do the surgery, you take out the uh, the lump. You do uh, in the third trimester, you do uh, the sentinel lymph lift biopsy, and then after the birth, you could do the radiation. So don't do it while the patient is pregnant. You could do breast conserving therapy, but you gotta watch out the timing. During the first months of rate. Uh, the first trimester of the fetus's life, you don't want to give any radiation or uh, you know radioactive tracer. So you do the third trimester, you take out the lump, and then after birth, you can finish with the radiation. So what are some of the common breast, uh, benign breast lesions that you'll be discuss in your uh, in your exam? So abscesses. That's a very common question they ask because then you want to differentiate abscess versus uh, uh, possibly malignant lesion, right? So they will usually describe a you know breastfeeding woman. You will have a painful breast mass, right? It's going to be a localized mass that's painful. Remember, painful usually tells you that you're not dealing with cancer. They'll have some type of, you know systemic symptoms, fever, and some kind of it possibly a discharge from the mass. The most common cause is staph aureus, and in terms of treatment. If there's an abscess, you always you get an incision and drainage, and you have to give them antibiotics. And common antibiotics you give is a doxycycline or oxycycline or any any of these type of antibiotics. Remember, these are mesocillin susceptible susceptible infections, so you don't have to give vancomycin for these. How about mastitis? So don't get confused with abscess. Infectious mastitis is there's not a mass; it's a cellulitis of the nipple. So a pregnant female breastfeeds and gets irritated, and some of the oral flora from the baby gets into the um, the nipple and causes an infection. It is painful and you see in a breastfeeding woman but you do not have a distinct mass. You could have, you know, you could have or not a f fever if you, uh, you know, that could be described in the question step. The same um, causes staph aureus and you want to give it doxycycline or oxycycline. Don't pick vancomycin because most likely the cause is methicillin susceptible staph aureus. Important abscesses you stop breastfeeding you use breast pump you don't want a baby to you know um, uh, breastfeed around the big you know mass that's like full of infection right but you could you could still drain you use a breast pump and you could feed the baby if there's mastitis you don't stop breastfeeding you it actually helps with the infection so they will ask you this question usually in your surgery or ob gyn shelf if there's infectious mastitis don't stop breastfeeding and you could breastfeed while you're giving antibiotics as well now if you have abscess or mastitis and you give antibiotics one or two weeks on antibiotics and it doesn't get be better, then you want to think of some kind of a malignant lesion. Galactoseals. You might see this or not, but you know, just to be uh, you know, cover the whole base, it's it is a breast cyst filled with milk. So you have a lot of cysts in your breast, and it can get you know uh, inf uh, filled with a uh, with milk, right? It's non-bacterial, painless. It's just um, it's enlarging at the end of breastfeeding. That's what the common. Uh, High yield word they'll to describe. There's no fevers. It's not tender. There's no skin changes. It's not an infection. So what do you do? You massage the breast, and if it becomes too bothersome, you aspirate it. Now, if you're aspirating and it's it's bloody, remember, bloody is you know you send it to cytology, and you gotta do some kind of uh, evaluation for malignancy as well. Mondor's disease. So this is rarely covered in a lot of textbooks, but I've seen it show up on. Uh, couple of the you know the question bags that are testing of uh, you know preparatory testing so Mondor's disease is a superficial vein thrombo uh, phlebitis of the breast so there's a lot of veins if they get um, you know clogged and you know the superficial veins and they can get infected remember anything that gets clogged behind it there'll be some kind of infection right and uh, it causes visible changes so what they describe is a palpable tender cord right it's not a distinct lesion distinct mass it's you know it's they describe it a palpable tendal cord right and it's usually described in a lower quadrant of the breast but it could you know literally happen anywhere around the breast and how you treat it is NSAIDs and warm compresses it's just very um, you know conservative therapy and this is how what it looks like uh, you see a vein here and you know probably clotted off get infected so it just becomes very visible fat necrosis so fat necrosis is what happens is you know after a trauma uh, the tissue around it, the fat gets calcified due to saponification and look for somebody who's a recent trauma or some kind of surgery you know uh, some um, a lady got into a car accident it, the steering wheel hit her chest or uh, anything you know that you know describes in the question stem 
somebody's a younger person, right? You wait, you see if it goes away in one, two months. But remember, an older person, you always want to rely on malignancy. Anybody older than 40, especially 50, you want to do always a mass. Does you see a mass? You do some kind of triple test. You do imaging, an exam, and some kind of a tissue biopsy. Fibrocystic changes, right? So there's different types. It's you see a normal woman then younger than 35. Um, so what there's a, there's a cyclical breast pain, mass size that changes during menstruation, and you know it's rubbery. It's gonna be like described uh, very benignly. You can move it around. It's not adhered. There's no lymph nodes. So very benign sounding question stem. Some buzzwords they might sort of blue dome appearance cyst. That's fibrocystic change. And you could drain this. If you clear, you're done. Remember, if it's bloody, you need some kind of a biopsy. There's two types that are very worrisome, and they can show up on your exam. That's not very likely, but I want you just out of to be complete. I want you to remember, atypical ductal hyperplasia and atypical lobular hyperplasia. Right? That's a worrisome um, type of fibrocystic chain that could become malignant. So the way to remember, remember, ductal carcinoma and lobular carcinoma are the common cancers of the breast, right? And if they're a duct atypical ductal hyperplasia, it just sounds bad, right? Atypical lobular hyperplasia, it's atypical and it's hyperplastic, then you want to worry some about a little bit higher risk malignancy. So that's when you start evaluating that the fibrocystic change. But otherwise in the other ones you really just aspirate it. If it's normal, it doesn't come back, then you're done. Fibroadenoma. Fibroadenoma is the most common breast lesion in young women. So if a young woman comes in for evaluation of a breast mass, you want to think of fibroadenoma. So it's described very benignly. It's well de delineated. It's slow growing. It's firm. It's rubber. It's you could move it. There's no lymph nodes. You could read the question and feel that it's is like very benign sounding. It's um, the reason that you get, um, a lot of young people get it is because it's very responsive to estrogen. They describe a size that changes during menstruation. It, you know, it's cyclical, right? It can get bigger during pregnancy. Remember, pregnant women, there's a lot of estrogen and hormones going around. So um, the pregnant women, it's very worrisome. But you got to look at the question, see what, how does it sound. Some buzzwords have popcorn calcifications. So you might not say popcorn here. What's the coarse calcification? That's like a... Uh, a word that you see in a mam uh, on, on mammogram description that tells you that's most likely fibroadenoma. If they're younger than 40, right? So you could do exam and imaging, right? Remember, and you could do FNA. Um, so you just you gotta do some kind of a triple test. Uh, it's still a mass, uh, even though you're most likely to be fibroadenoma. You don't know that's a fibroadenoma just by looking at it, right? In the exam, if they described as uh, you know benign features, then that kind of helps you focus on how to treat it. Imaging, you start with the ultrasound. Remember, they're younger than 40. That's the age cutoff that I would use. You don't want to give them radiation, so you do ultrasound. And if an A shows fibroadenoma, you're done. You have to have all three. If you don't have all three, you need a biopsy to definitively rule out uh, a cancer, even in somebody younger than 40. Now, how about 40? No matter what, they will need some kind of excisional biopsy or a coronary biopsy to ensure that you you have a fibroadenoma not cancer. So remember, anybody who's older than 40, older women, are there's high likelihood that the mass could be cancerous. Remember, if they're older than 50 and there's a breast mass, you should think that it's breast cancer until proven otherwise. So in their 40s, you want to do some kind of biopsy. You got to do the imaging, the exam, and FNA if you have to, but FNA is in, you know, screening exam. You need a definite tissue to see if it's not cancer. Intraductal papilloma, right? That's the most common cause of bloody discharge. So you see most, you know, you see bloody discharge described as we discussed earlier. You got to think intraductal papilloma. It's usually non-palpable because it's inside the ducts, right? And it's not pre-malignant. So it's not a cancer um, per se, right? You get a ductogram, so you inject a dye in the duct, find a bleeding duct, and you take it out. This is what a ductogram looks like. You inject it into the nipple. You, you see, oh, it's bleeding over here. You localize it. You take it out. Now, malignant breast disease, that's, you know, the question. You want to find out if the this is malignant or not, right? So remember, new cases of cancer. So a woman most likely to get a breast cancer, lung, and then colon next, men, prostate, lung, and colon. The most common cause is lung cancer. Then in the breast of the prostate, so women have the breast, men have the prostate, and then colon. So colon stays, colon rectum stays third, 
rest of the lung switch spots in terms of incidence and cancer death. So that's why you have all these screenings because they're so common. So metastasis, so sometimes they might not tell you, they tell you a 52 year old woman comes in and she has bone pain, right? And she had a fracture after like a little bit of minor trauma. So some minor trauma, she was, you know, walking up the stairs, she fell a little bit, used her hand to stop herself and it broke. You, you know, you should not have that. In, and so that should be very worrisome. Other common areas they'll describe lung, liver, and brain. I would focus on the lungs. So if they say, you know, a 52-year-old woman comes in, she's having breast, you know, their x-ray, there's a concerned mass, you do a biopsy, and you get uh, some kind of adenocarcinoma or something. Then you want to think of the breast as the most common cause of that. Risk factors, it's all about estrogen exposure. So if you have early menarche to late menopause, early menarche, that means earlier exposure to estrogen, late menopause, that means you longer period that you're exposed to estrogen. So that should be a, um, one of your biggest concerns. Remember, the greatest risk is age. As you get older, right, the cancer in, in, in women is actually higher. So that's why I said, if the question stem describes that a grandmother had breast cancer at age 82, that is not an actual, you're still at a higher risk, but it's not as worrisome because as you get older, you're you kind of higher likely to develop cancer. Obviously, BRCA1 and BRCA2, sorry for the mistake, and family history. So they describe, you know, my mom had it, my aunt had it, four or five people in my family had it, then you got to, you know, worry about uh, uh, family history there. So a little bit of anatomy uh, going forward, right? So this is where we're going to focus on. So you have the nipple and drains into the, the, the collecting ducts which drain into the individual ducts and they go to the functional area. So this is this whole thing is a lobule, so you see the black circle. And within lobules, you have lobule cells and they drain into the ducts, right? And that's where you have the ductal cells. So ductal cell carcinoma in situ, right? Or that's DCIS, it's pre-malignant. So it doesn't mean it's cancer right now, it's pre-malignant. It does not invade the basement membrane it's not palpable, right? That's why you do a mammogram. And common mammogram word, you know, verbiage that you'll see on the question stem is the speculated calcifications. Now, the treatment, this is where it gets confusing. So it's insider. That means it does not invade the base membrane. There's there's no potential for metastasis, right? So you don't you don't have to do a lymph node dissection because it's insider, right? So you do a lumpectomy, you take out the lump, and then you do local radiation. Right, and just to make sure, or you could do a simple mastectomy without radiation. But you remember, it's DCIS. You don't do lymph node sampling because, by definition, it did not invade the basement membrane, so there's no potential for metastasis. Lobular carcinoma in situ, or LCIS, right? Now, compared with DCIS, it's not a pre-malignant lesion, right? So DCIS will become cancer if you don't take care of it, but LCIS is not gonna, you know, doesn't, it's not pre-malignant. But what LCIS tells you that you ha you're at a higher risk of getting cancer in the future. So people get LCIS more likely developed to ductal carcinoma in the, f uh, carcinoma in the f future. So it's more likely to be my bilateral, that's why you gotta image both breaths. Right? So if you have LCIS, so you get a question on this, possibly if you get LCIS in the left breast, does that mean you have a higher chance of LC, uh, DCIS in, uh, in your left breast? No, it means that you have a higher chance of getting cancer in both breasts, right? Do a core biopsy, you find that it's LCIS, you take out the, the mass, and that's it. You don't take out any more breast tissue, you don't have to irritate, right? You take it out, if it's LCIS, you take a little bit of breast tissue, make sure you have uh, margins, and that's it. Whereas DCIS, you have to do you know, um, some kind of radiation. Now, ductal carcinoma. If DCIS, if you don't take care of it, it's going to invade the basement membrane. It's going to become ductal carcinoma. It's the most common cause of breast cancer, right? Worrisome signs. Obviously, it's firm. It's immobile. It's you know, it's it, adhered to another tissue. It causes nipple retraction. And if you have you know somebody who's older than fifty, postmenopausal woman, that's a very worrisome sign. Inflammatory carcinoma. This is where you get the peau d'orange or the orange peel. That's just what happens is the cancer invades the dermal lymphatics, right? And it causes the skin to thicken, redden, and dimple, right? So they'll describe the thickened skin. It's red all around and it's dimpling. So dimpling is a very common word, a classic. They'll describe it with this. 
don't get it confused with cellulitis. Cellulitis will get better if you give antibiotic, and you'll have systemic symptoms. You'll have fever. You know, vital signs will be abnormal. Whereas this inflammatory carcinoma, you don't have fever with it, right? And it will not respond to antibiotic. Now, in order to fully evaluate it, you have to do a punch biopsy. You want to see the cancer cell in the dermis. Remember, it invades the dermal lymphatics, right? And some of the things it will describe is they get pre-op chemotherapy and inflammatory carcinoma, whereas other ones necessarily don't. That's what it looks like. It's a thickened, invades the dermal, it's a red and around. You could see it looks like kind of like an orange peel. Phylloides tumor or sister sarcoma phylloides, right? It's like it's the it's a question stem that describe like the breast mass that gets just abnormally large. So they will describe some kind of like Hispanic immigrant or somebody who's an immigrant, right? For some reason, because in America, if a woman gets some kind of breast mass, she immediately goes to physician. Now, immigrants, because of the financial concerns or lack of care in their own home country, necessarily don't. So you just let it grow for a long time. So that's where they will describe an you know, possibly an immigrant. It's actually most are benign. Sarcoma is actually a misnomer, but you still want to manage it, right? You do imaging and a biopsy, right? And um, you do some kind of excisional biopsy, and it'll show some fibroadenoma, phylloris tumor, you take it out, and you're done. If for some reason it shows cancer, you have to do a simple mastectomy and a lymph node dissection, right? Now, these cancers get so big that breast conserving therapy does, is not going to you know, because the mass is just going to be huge, you want to take out the whole breast, and you could do possibly talk with uh, um, plastics for breast reconstruction. But for really big, you know, tumors, the breast conserving therapy is not going to work. So you can see this in this image is just uh, it, the mass is huge. Is really breast conserving therapy might not be your optimal choice. Patches disease. This tends to show up a lot on the question banks. Is it's you want to think of it. It's described as like the eczema of the of the nipple, right? It's itching. It's red, scaly, flaky, right? It just like sounds like an eczema. So what you want to do is you want to do a punch biopsy of the skin, and it will describe vacuolated cells, right? Patches disease. If you describe Patches disease of the breast, that means you have a higher risk of underlying cancer. So you do a mastectomy to make sure that uh, the the pathologist and diseases, there's no other residual cancer cells in there. So it does not necessarily mean it's a cancer, but it means that underlying, you have a higher risk of possibly having cancer. It's a marker for it. Now, some uh, something about the therapy, right? Let's talk about that. So you have drug-sensitive tumors, right? There's two hormones that I'll describe. is estrogen, it's ER, and a progesterone. And there's a receptor for... Um, um, tumor cells, we don't want to go into it, it's called HER2, uh, HER2 receptor or HER2 new receptor. And what it does is it um, helps, uh, you know, the cancer cells proliferate, proliferate them. it's a growth uh, uh, marker. So if you have an ERPR positive, right, you do tamoxifen, right? Tamoxifen is a selective es estrogen receptor blocker, so it's selective, it's called SERM, right? It blocks estrogen receptors in the breast, but also activates estrogen receptors in the uterus. So you have an increased risk of endometrial cancer. The way I think about it, it's a partial activator, right? In the breast, you have a lot of estrogen receptors, so if you partially activate it, that means you actually downgrade it. But not in the uterus, because you partially activate it, it'll increase your endometrial cancer. You also have raloxifene, which uh, it's the same you know, idea, it's just a newer agent, and it has a lower endometrial risk. And remember, any type of serum, Remember, women have a higher chance of getting uh, DVTs, and if you just give them LR estrogen, it increases the risk of blood clots. So remember that going forward as well. This actually becomes very useful. So the reason is, let's talk about look at this and this first. If you have a premenopausal woman, you have your hypothalamus sends signals. You make estradiol, and your ovaries make testosterone. It's converted to estradiol, right? And then estradiol goes in your breast tumor, uh, breast tumor tissue, or in breast tissue, and activates your target genes and helps tumor growth. Same thing in postmenopausal women, but remember, majority of their estrogen is made in your know, peripheral tissues, adipose tissues. So the ovaries don't really play a role because it's, um, you know, you're postmenopausal. They could, there's no more. Uh, hormone made there. So that's why the aromatase would actually work in postmenopausal because you're not doing anything to the ovaries. Now, if you block this here, you're not making any estrogen, which is a majority in the premenopausal pre woman. So if you use an aromatase inhibitor, you're going to cause a drug induced menopause, which is not good. 
So you have aromatase inhibitors, the most common one is anastrozole. If anything, uh, this is an AI or an uh, aromatase inhibitor. It completely blocks the synthesis of estrogen in females. Remember, use only in postmenopausal women. In the premenopausal woman, is you're gonna cause a drug-induced um, menopause, and that's bad. Remember, uh, postmenopausal women have a higher risk of osteoporosis because estrogen, uh, and because of estrogen effects in the bones. Go to the endo uh, endocrine lectures and look uh, how that would affect in the calcium synthesis. But so just don't give AIs in premenopausal women. And don't give any type of hormonal treatment in pregnant patients. You don't want to do uh, anything that can cause a placenta. So don't give any hormonal treatment in pregnant patients. Trastuzumab, that's a HER2 new receptor antagonist, right? So this can cause cardiomyopathy. So you want to evaluate them with the echo or MUGA scan. So if you don't see echo in the question, don't, you know, like, what do I do? The most common cause, the bad side effect is cardiomyopathy. And you do that to evaluate the heart. Now, chemotherapy, there's not a lot of times where they ask you about the chemo correction, but there's a couple of patients who get chemo. Inflammatory breast cancer, the ones with the pseudo orange, they get preoperative uh, chemotherapy. Metastasized cancer, obviously going to get chemo because it's a higher disease. And triple negative, ER, PR negative, and HER2 new negative, it's a triple negative one, they get chemo in addition to surgery because you can't do a hormone because the receptor is not there, and that's the worst, right? So you want to do some kind of chemotherapy to address it. Now, BRCA, you're bound to get some kind of question out of it. Now, um, but most likely in your ob shell rather than a surgery shell. So if they describe multiple family history of breast cancer, especially in the first um, relatives and, you know, it was just, you read the question, you'll know, like, mom had it, aunt had it, three, four people had it. Then you test for a BRCA gene. So if, they, if they're positive, they get a prophylactic mastectomy. Now, in addition to prophylactic mastectomy, they should also consider total abdominal hysterectomy and oophorectomy in high-risk patients because birth uh, positivity does not only cause um, increased breast cancer, but also ovarian and uh, endometrial cancer as well. Men do get breast cancer too, so which patients you'll, uh, you'll be worried in the question? You want to think of patient, patients with Klinefelter syndrome, so what describe is a uh, you know, a tall uh, male with uh, female-like features, uh, a higher breast tissue, and uh, uh, different hair growth pattern. Uh, see, uh, so those, they have higher estrogen, so higher chance of breast cancer. Bodybuilders take a lot of testosterone. Testosterone gets converted to estrogen, and that can cause an uh, increased chance of breast cancer. And men can get bur uh, BRCA2 gene as well, and then the BRCA2 gene in men actually increase the risk of their uh, uh, breast cancer risk. Don't get confused with gynecomastia. Gynecomastia is just a little enlargement of breast tissue. There's not a breast mass, and that's not cancerous, right? Think of uh, somebody who's, uh, you know, possibly Klinefelter's maybe. Uh, some uh, patients, you know, are, you know, during teenage years when you have a higher um, a teenage males, higher testosterone that gets converted to estrogen. So you could have increased breast tissue, and that's not cancerous necessarily. So let's go over some review questions before we're done today. So first question, a female patient complains of nipple discharge. Which kind of discharge would indicate a worrisome sign? So where would you be worried? If they had a green discharge, if they have bilateral discharge, they had a bloody discharge or spontaneous discharge. So green discharge, right? You wor worried about a green discharge, it's fibrocystic disease. So that's mainly a benign disease, so not necessarily. Bilateral discharge. Now, bilateral discharge indicates some kind of a systemic issue. So this is where you want to think of a pituitary adenoma that's causing uh, gynecomastia and it could cause bilateral discharge or hyperprolactoma or you know, disease that increases a prolactin discharge. So not necessarily. So if it's bilateral, there's something systemic going on rather than a mass. Bloody discharge. Which What was a common cause of bloody discharge? Intradactyl papilloma. Yes. So that leaves us with the spontaneous discharge. So if there's spontaneous, there's not a cause, there's just randomly comes on unilateral, you want to be, uh, you get worried about uh, possible malignancy. Now, if you have a breastfeeding woman and she has mastitis, so she does not have an abscess, but she has uh, mastitis, what is the treatment, right? Do you stop breastfeeding and then give antibiotics? Do you continue breastfeeding and get antibiotics? 
do you know, incision and drainage of the of the area, give antibiotics and continue breastfeeding, or you just do incision drainage and give antibiotics. So remember, with mastitis, not abscess, you want to continue breastfeeding because that just kind of moves the blood around and helps heal that, and you want to give antibiotics on it. So just giving antibiotics and having a mastitis is not a contraindication of breastfeeding. Very common question that you will be getting on your uh, question banks and possibly exams in your future. In a woman who presents with tender palpable cord that's been present for two days, what would be the best treatment? So remember, if they said tender palpable cord, I should already think of a Mondor disease, right? And what was a Mondor disease? It's, I guess, uh, superficial thrombophlebitis of a vein around the breast, right? So it's very benign. You don't want to do breast conserving therapy, right? Which is non cancerous. Simple mastectomy, so that's too much for a benign disease. NSAIDs, possibly tamoxifen, that's what you do in the, you don't want to do that before you uh, figure out what the mass is, and excisional biopsy for the same, that's a little bit more radical. So you want to do NSAIDs, very conservative therapy for somebody with a tender palpable cord on their, around their breast. And remember, it's most likely to be in a lower quadrant. Now, 47-year-old female presents on a routine mammogram with an area of local calcification. You do not feel the lump, uh, there's no axillary um, Masses, it's just a routine mammogram. You see some kind of a area of local calcification. Um, so what do you do? Do you repeat the mammogram six months? Do you get an ultrasound to confirm? You do an FNA? Do you get a corneal biopsy or test them for burka? So nothing here tells us about family history, so we would not pick burka testing. Would you repeat mammogram in six months? So you already got mammogram, so it's local calcification, right? And ultrasound is not going to give you that much bigger of a detail, right? So you want to do some kind of, you already did a physical exam, right? You got your imaging. What's the third part? It's the tissue, right? And remember, corneal biopsy is better than the FNA. So that's why you would pick a corneal biopsy. You have a 36-year-old woman um, who comes to the, you know, MD to the physician with two days of bloody discharge, and it's from the left nipple. Exam is normal, mammogram shows no abnormalities. What's the most likely cause? So what's the most likely cause of a bloody discharge? Intradactyl papilloma, correct. I would remember this. You have a 46-year-old woman who is evaluated for a lump in her right breast. Palpation reveals a lump in the right upper quadrant that does not appear to be fixed. The patient has no other dominant masses in either breast. There's no axillary lymphadenopathy and mammogram is negative. What's the next best manager? So look at the age, it's 46, right? There's a breast lump and the imaging is negative, but the imaging should never guide you in terms of the management, right? Somebody who's older than 40, somebody, you know, um, if there's a breast mass, you want to think of cancer. And what's the best way to evaluate that? You have to get a, some kind of a tissue biopsy, and this is only two. Remember, core needle biopsy is way better than the FNA. So you want to pick a corneal biopsy. So some finishing remarks. I'm sorry for the length of the lecture, but it's a very high yield lecture. If you have a breast mass in a woman older than 50 or even older than 40, you want to think it's cancer until proven otherwise. Especially if it's 50s, you know, it's a very worrisome sign. Pain is most likely not to be cancer. You want to think of other benign causes that can cause pain. And mastitis and an abscess is most likely mesicillin susceptible infection, so you don't want to use mancomycin, so use a doxycillin or oxycillin. And also some high yield fact that it can show up on some of the question bands is it says MSSA causes infections of the salivary gland, so you would treat it the same way. So it's uh, not vancomycin. All right, so that concludes our lecture, and hopefully uh, we'll see you uh, for our future lectures. All right.